Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I think now is a good time to start. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This is quite a good turnout. Uh, this afternoon, we're very privileged to have with us the Vice President of the Asian Development Bank for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development. Just a brief two-minute introduction, which really doesn't do justice to her very illustrious career, but we'd like to hear more of her. Uh, Dr. Ursula schaefer Preus is an economist by training, and she started her career in international development in Germany at the German Development Cooperation, which is the uh, development arm of the German government. But apart from that, she has joined the United Nations um, for the German mission to the UN in the 90s, and also as alternate executive director of the um, international, sorry, the Inter- American Development Bank. Um, she speaks Spanish rather fluently, now is living in the Philippines and says that uh, she'd like to go hiking but not in the weather, does swimming, <laughs> and of course um, travels the world all over to talk about knowledge management mm -hmm. at the ADB. And for this afternoon, what she's going to talk to us about is the progress, or lack thereof, on the um, Millennium Development Goals, particularly with regard to the uh, bank's work. So without much further ado, let me, let's all welcome Dr. Ursula schaefer Preus. That one. Thanks. Yeah, good afternoon to all of you. I'm uh, maybe a little from time to time. Um, difficult with my throat. I've been uh, in Delhi uh, for a week there. It was uh, quite cold and um, now back more or less in the same climate in the Philippines and my throat has uh, to adjust a little bit on that. Thanks for your introductory remarks and uh, what I would like to say at the outset that I'm really very happy to be here again in the Liqua U School of um, Public Policy um, I have been here about one and a half years ago for the first time when Sitharam's office was still just an office but uh, not uh, populated, so I've seen it now. It's really uh, very nice and uh, I see you have uh, even a broader mandate here. ADB has a very close relationship with the Lee Kuan Yew School. Our president, Koroda, visited the school in November last year and uh, some of my uh, colleagues, the director general has been here and so on, and uh, also the one looking into uh, the Millennium Development Goals, uh, Shilo Chatterjee, I don't know whether you, some of you have been here at that time. And um, I'm really looking forward uh, to our discussions today um, on the, uh, a very vital subject, the uh, Millennium Development Goals, and um, uh, what uh, progress uh, we have made so far in the um, Asia-Pacific region. Uh, this year marks a decade, one decade, since the international community adopted the Millennium Development, Millennium, Millennium Declaration, entering into a historic compact to reduce global hunger, poverty, ill health, and other major uh, deprivations and discriminations. We have covered two-thirds of a time till 2015 when the MDGs are to be achieved. Some progress has occurred, but much more remains to be done. Our progress has been slowed considerably by the economic crisis. Luckily, the Asia and Pacific region has a comparative um, uh, resilience uh, that has met, meant that a slowdown of growth has occurred here rather than a contraction, a slowdown and not a contraction. A quicker recovery also appears to be taking place. Nevertheless, the crisis has made the task of M achieving the MDGs much harder. With only five more years to go before the year 2015, it is time to take stock and assess where we are and how far we still need to go. Sorry. <coughs> we also must carefully assess whether the strategies we have adopted to achieve 
the MDGs are working or not, and how must these be altered. The international community has begun uh, this review and reflection process this year, and we have started this as well for the Asia-Pacific region. To begin with, how is our region faring on MDGs? To answer this, I will request you to consider the two following slides. The figures in these slides are from forthcoming, a forthcoming joint publication of ADB, UNDP, and UNSCAP, which we are launching later this month. This is an exercise we do now for the fourth time, monitoring the progress uh, on the MDGs together with uh, UNDP and uh, UNSCAP uh, Bangkok. Estimates based on data prior to the crisis summarized in this slide here show that the region as a whole progress shown in the first row has made good progress in several areas. These are shown as either black dots representing targets achieved already or as green triangles pointing upwards. This means that the targets, uh, target is expected to be reached in 2015. Thus, for instance, the target in the, of the first indicator, halving the share of people in extreme poverty um, with less than $1.25 a day by 2015 compared to the 1990 base year is likely to be achieved. This is a major achievement with the number of the poor in the region falling dramatically from over 1.4 billion in 1990 to about 903 million in the year um, 2005. Other areas where the region's progress is good are gender equality in education, controlling major health hazards such as HIV and TB, increasing areas protected for maintaining biodiversity, reducing consumption of ozone-depleting substances, and access of the population to clean water. However, other major development tasks are likely to remain unfulfilled. These shown in the orange squares, which will be achieved after 2015, and red triangles, those which are regressing, include the target to halve the incidence of child hunger, ensuring that children complete primary education, reducing infant and child mortality by two-thirds compared to 1990, ensuring adequate care of expecting mothers, and proper medical attendance from, for them during childbirth, protecting forests, reducing carbon dioxide emissions, and access to improved sanitation. The region's performance is not uniform, though. Some subregions are likely to fare even worse than the average, such as the group of least developed countries in the Pacific Islands. In order to better understand the magnitude of the unfinished agenda before us, consider this slide. It shows both the total population facing various kinds of deprivation in the region as well as what each kind represents as a share of the world's total. <coughs> Thus, a staggering 1.7 billion people remain without basic sanitation in rural and urban areas together. Another half a billion do not have access to clean water. The slide also shows that the Asia-Pacific region is home to over 70% of world's population living in rural areas without basic sanitation, as well as the world's underweight children. Over 60% of those in extreme poverty, those without access to sanitation in urban areas, and those living with TB. And over half of those in the world without access to clean water. 
However, the estimates of progress in the MDGs discussed in the previous slide and the absolute numbers of the deprived discussed here are ba on this slide, slide are based on pre-crisis data. With the significant slowdown that we have experienced, our further progress on poverty reduction and towards achieving the MDGs has also slowed. Now let me turn to the impact of the crisis. Growth in the region has been a powerful force freeing millions from poverty. With a slowdown in growth, there is a general consensus that about 50 to 60 million people who would otherwise have been freed from poverty will now remain trapped in that state due to the crisis. Our studies show that the region's slowdown will also affect progress on other MDGs. Thus, less revenues will with public authorities, particularly local governments, is likely to result in cuts in public social expenditures. Poor households, too, are likely to cut expenditures in areas that can be deferred, although they are important, such as health and nutrition. Based on past experience, we feel that the MDG indicators most likely to be affected are those relating to hunger and health, and to a lesser extent, primary education. The crisis is also likely to affect women disproportionately, as large numbers of them work in low-skilled jobs in export sectors, Cambodia is such an example, which are likely to be cut. Let me now turn <coughs> to needed policy and strategic responses to the crisis. These include short-term measures to deal with economic shocks such as we are experiencing now and which may visit us in the future as our economies get more integrated with the world. They also must include more long-term measures to deal with vulnerabilities in general ways, in general and ways to achieve basic standards of social development for our citizens. Most countries have responded to the crisis by adopting much needed stimulus measures to assist the forces of growth when exports and private investments have fallen. However, there are two issues that I would like to highlight in this context. First, most stimulus measures have focused on areas other than social expenditures. This is shown in the figure on the left in this slide. Given that social spending needs to be st stepped up rapidly if the MDGs are to be achieved in the region, this represents a major missed opportunity. However, those countries planning more stimulus measures could focus more on the social side to rectify this imbalance. Secondly, had governments spent more on the social side, they may have been able to impact a bigger fiscal stimulus as social expenditures directed towards the poor are likely to generate larger expansions in spending. This is illustrated on the figure on the right. In many cases, the growth impact may have been twice as large if all spending were in the social sectors. We use this only as an illustration to stress the point that more social spending could have yielded a double dividend, more growth as well as more social and human development. While stimulus measures must be resorted in the short run, the region's economies must also plan to reduce their vulnerability to external shocks, which they will be exposed to more and more as they integrate in the world economy. 
our joint report, ADB, UNSCAP, and UNDP, has attempted to develop a vulnerability indicator. This is a new instrument to generate thinking on this matter. This indicator has two parts. The first part looks at the degree of exposure to external shocks resulting from exports, foreign investments, remittances, official development assistance, and tourism revenues. The second part looks at capacity, capacity to cope with them dependent on macroeconomic stability, institutional capacity, and social development. This slide shows where the region and sub-regions um, are compared to others. Exposure is measured on the vertical and capacity on the horizontal axis. Thus, while the Asia-Pacific region is more exposed than Africa, it has better capacity to handle vulnerabilities but its capacity is less than that of Latin America. Although countries can try to reduce vulnerability resulting from exposure, such as trade diversification or more regional integration, which I will be discussing later, they can do a lot to increase their capacity to cope also. An important determinant of this capacity is social and human development towards which the MDGs play an important role. While reducing vulnerability is important, <clears throat> it's equally crucial that countries in the region take long-term measures to provide effective coverage to their vulnerable population through social protection measures. In this respect, the region has far to go. As illustrated by this slide, only about 35% of the region's population is covered under some form of social protection. Some countries in Asia have even less coverage. If one excludes Japan and Korea at the bottom of this slide, Covering only the developing countries, the Asian average goes down to 31%. New forms of vulnerability, such as aging, are also emerging, and this is particularly an issue in Asia. The region is, has therefore to focus more on this area. While Individual countries can do much more to improve social protection. Collective regional efforts can also contribute effectively to reducing the region's vulnerability. This slide here lists the more crucial measures needed. Thus, trade and investment integration of the region is considered an important way that the region can withstand shocks originating from outside the region. Monetary and exchange rate coordination can also strengthen the process. Similarly, the time has come for the region to play a bigger role in supporting its least developed countries, like Nepal or Lao PDR and not depend on resource flows from outside that are uncertain. Cooperation in areas of food security will allow greater price stability in this vital area and play a major role in reducing hunger. Just as investment flows within the region need to be encouraged, so also the flow of labor from labor surplus economies in the region to labor short economies need to be better regulated and managed to mutual benefit for all. And I think um, I would like to circulate the study where all this is uh, included and so you can have a uh, little inside view, just circulate it around. Finally, I would like to end by posing some crucial issues 
that we need to consider as we look forward in the future. Clearly, past efforts by countries individually and also by the international community in the last decade since 2000 have been ins insufficient to achieve the MDGs. Have the MDGs been orderly, overly ambitious or have we erred in our priorities? <clears throat> The imbalance between uh, towards social sectors in the stimulus packages tends to indicate that more allocation of resources towards them is possible. Growing problems faced by many countries in our region arising out of social exclusions also indicate that greater prioritization is needed towards social and inclusive development. Many countries can do much more to generate resources domestically, such as through improving tax governance. Such resources could be devoted to social development. The region's social needs are somewhat more immediate than others which are long-term in nature. Thus, while protecting the environment, and taking measures to address climate change are crucial, they should not come at the cost of social development. Have we attained the right balance in our international development priorities? Indeed, we must find ways of supporting both the social and climate change agendas without making them rivals competing for the same resources. Another issue concerns collective regional efforts to achieve the MDGs, which are still somewhat in their infancy. A major lesson for the region is that we have to play a greater role jointly to ensure adequate social development for all of the region's citizens. We cannot rely solely on external resources. How can we incalculate a greater regional spirit and set in motion processes of regional cooperation at the social front? And I think this is a real challenge. These are just a few um, of the crucial issues that confront us at this critical point in time, five years before the uh, um, completion of the Millennium Development Goals should be reached. With little time left to achieve all these goals, we need to consider whether major course corrections on the development path are necessary. Crafting the right answers to these will determine our region's future. And this is what we are uh, focusing on in this uh, MDG report 209, which will be launched um, in two weeks from now. And then you can also get the full report. But this was just um, giving you an overview where we stand and where we think the challenges are. I thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Ursula. That was a very sobering uh, presentation, particularly when we think of uh, you know, when you live and work in Singapore with a per capita income of um, over $23,000. It's often said that Singapore is uh, an overdeveloped country living in a sea of underdevelopment. OK, we have um, an open forum for about half an hour or so. Um, Please ask your questions, identify yourself, your organizational affiliation. I will take three questions at a time. First three questions, please. Yes, in the back, in the middle, here, and Natalia. Please, in the back. Do I need to repeat all that? <laughs> okay, my name is Sala Glashus from the Asia Europe uh, Foundation. My question simply is, um, I find it very interesting that uh, international 
uh, institutions um, speak about the Millennium Development Goals. But um, what we have to recognize is that this has uh, sort of receded from um, the general international public discourse. It needs a lot more of political um, buy-in as well. And um, while a lot of this uh, information is very interesting, especially this, uh, I, I find in particularly in particular interesting um, this, the, the, the joint work by ADB, UNDP on uh, this vulnerability versus capacity um, that that will be extremely useful and interesting for policymakers. But what about the political buy-in? Where do we get that from? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, a student at the LKY. Uh, basically, two quick questions. Uh, you, you 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 mentioned that uh, reg regional cooperation is key in this uh, whole uh, MDG process. Uh, but as as we are as we are aware. There's a lot of imbalance in Asia, like you just touched upon. How do you envision all this uh, regionalization coming together, despite the imbalances? Uh, another quick question is, uh, with, the, with the financial crisis like you highlighted, do you think uh, development partners are using it as a, as a tool or an excuse to possibly extend their mandate uh, post-2015? Thank you. Uh, Natalia Olenek from Impact Investment Exchange Asia. Um, it's obvious that government and foreign aid have failed to make sufficient progress in, on the MDGs. Um, would you discuss, please, what the role of social enterprises can play, such as microfinance, in filling this gap, and um, the ADB's role in helping develop this sector? Well a lot of interesting questions. Well, the, the first question, the, um, um, well, the buy-in um, for, for um, policymakers, indeed, with uh, such a, um, a progress report and uh, with the uh, um, um, high-level segment of the um, um, General Assembly in September, I should have said that earlier, Ban, Ban Ki-moon has um, um, uh, announced, and that will happen, that there will be a special day devoted uh, to the accomplishments uh, uh, at, with the MDGs before the opening of the uh, General Assembly in September to really uh, then, and the heads of states will uh, be participating in this uh, round, to really um, uh, bring the uh, accomplishments and the progress of the non-progress in specific areas of the MDGs to the attention of the policy makers and well, the governments. And then the question being how to um, go over it. And um, it's an open question how we will deal with the MDGs after the year 2015. So I think there's still um, a strong will and the desire and the wish to accomplish as much as can be accomplished until the year 2050. And so we really have to see what the assessment will be worldwide. I have given you a little um, uh, insight on where we stand um, as um, for 2009 in the Asia Pacific region. So I think um, the uh, general, uh, the high level segment and the special session on the MDGs in uh, November really will Aiming, will be aiming at the policymakers. Um, regional cooperation, and well, we, there are a lot of uh, regional imbalances, this is true, but um, looking, for example, into the um, greater Mekong subregion, ADB has been involved in uh, working with the countries of the greater Mekong subregion for now about 17 years. It took quite some time to start the process, but now we can see in many areas, be it um, with the bio corridors, um, transport sector, um, be it also, well, energy is now coming up, um, environmental um, activities. There are a lot of joint activities the countries are now doing together and trying to, to um, join forces, so to speak. We have um, um, done a lot in the infrastructure sector, for example, in the greater Mekong subregion, 
What is now a challenge, for example, is while the cars and the trucks and the uh, um, food, for example, can be moved faster, but the um, transit from one country to the other can be a challenge uh, due to customs regulations which have not yet been harmonized. That means there is still a lot to be done, but we are, I think, on the right path. And other uh, similar examples you could see in, in South Asia, but the most advanced, I think, in the context of regional cooperation and integration is indeed the greater Mekong sub-region area. Um, for the development partners, um, um, the uh, slow performance, whether the slow performance of the MDGs could be used as an ex um, excuse to expand the time span to, to accomplish what, what has been um, um, agreed upon, I think let's wait. I, I do hope that more pro progress can be made and um, um, I'm in a way an optimist having been working in development cooperation for now about 35 years. There's always um, hope, there are always good signs, well, there are from time to time then failures, but altogether I think and what has been um, accomplished already despite the financial crisis in the con context of the MDGs I think is a good thing and but we have to do it jointly together and hopefully continue what, what has been initiated so far. Um, the role of um, uh, social um, enterprises, um, this is really something where more should be done. There are quite a few initiatives but um, I personally think from time to time um, these um, initiatives are not very well um, coordinated. So I think also more exchange of experience is necessary. ADB is uh, closely looking into that, but um, we are not really actively involved. But we look at it and um, well, monitor what is going on there. Next round of three questions, please. <clears throat> yes, the lady in the back. Any other two questions? Yes, please. And let me ask a third question. Um, any insight on why Papua New Guinea scores the lowest in terms of uh, social protection to reduce vulnerabilities compared to Japan and Korea, which is the highest? Okay, let's start with, yes. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. What I'm interested about is when you say, MD, are the MDGs too ambitious? Uh, of course, we think no, especially in the health MDG, uh, MDG 4 and 5. And what I'm interested about is we tend to track the national indicators, such as infant mortality or maternal morta mor mortality rates. And if you look at Asia Pacific, the record seems quite positive. We've made tremendous progress in this regard. And yet, when you look at subnational level, the disparity across different provinces is tremendous. And that's where I think perhaps countries need more assistance on. And what concerns me with some of the latest kind of a rush, if you will, to meet the MDG goals, is that there will be an effort to look good on paper, you know, to get a, that score that you've met the MDGs. But we could actually achieve them without ever doing anything to the bottom quintile without ever improving the, the infant mortality or maternal mortality rates in some of the countries that still have uh, a lot in the bottom quintile. And so how much is the ADB and the other development partners doing to address MDGs, not just from a kind of a national average, but looking at the sub-regional disparities as well? Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, JP Melosh, uh, on the uh, studying for the Masters of Public Policy, uh, public administration at LKY. Um, my question on the MDG is, um, how can I say, do national governments actually own this? Do they feel that they are the primary actors that are responsible for implementing this? We hear a lot about MDGs from international organizations, but national governments, we, we don't hear a lot about them. Uh, one example is the, you have some, some goals on the water. Uh, providing clean water, wastewater treatment, and so on. That's not rocket science. 
um, the technology is there to provide this. The, um, the funding is there from international agencies. I mean, when ADB deals with governments, is it the ADB trying to push governments to realize the MDGs, which is sort of reverse, a reverse role where governments should be pushing the ADB to get funding for them to realize uh, the goals? Thank you. Oh, um, the third question was um, your chart on uh, social protection to reduce vulnerabilities. Um, Papua New Guinea scored the lowest, and Japan and Korea the highest. And I was wondering if you had any insight on why that is. Is it a political problem in Papua New Guinea, or maybe ADB is just not present enough there? I start with the last question. Um, Papua New Guinea is a um, specific a case uh, with a, a lot of um, cultural and ethnic complexities. And for that, it is really um, very, very difficult um, to um, yeah, um, get the um, a vulnerability um, situation being improved. HIV AIDS is, for example, um, uh, very um, problematic area, but uh, how to tackle this phenomenon is even more problematic out of uh, cultural reasons. So I think this is really um, the, the way it is. Um, maybe we do not have uh, uh, so solid enough statistical um, database, which in particular in um, the uh, um, Pacific countries can um, uh, pose a problem, but I think the overall um, trend, how it's uh, described in, in this um, study, is really what it is. Looking into um, national indicators and um, how really get uh, uh, the uh, um, um, phenomena um, down and um, the, the, the difficulties to, to really change uh, things at the sub-regional, sub-national and local level. This is something we discuss with our partners where the governments and then also the local institutions really have to get more actively involved. ADB can only do so much. We can present the fact and say, well, you should um, do this and that, but then it's really an internal um, decision how to really um, get these things across. We had, um, just to mention that, um, our, we have workshops for these uh, uh, MDG activities we do together with UNSCAP and UNDP. We had one uh, in Nepal with all the South Asian countries looking in particular into water, into health and nutrition. And there it was the general agreement among the participants from the various governments, also from the local institutions, that the assessments which has been um, um, taken on board at the national level really has to be brought down in uh, awareness building activities, training activities to the local level and see how one can really support the poor people at the local level to help them uh, improve their situation. So the uh, um, problem is well known, but then the question is, do the um, countries themselves have sufficient funds to have decentralized actions to uh, improve the situation? Um, yeah, I think with this I, I have also an answered the question related to uh, clean water and um, how really to, to look into this. There are ways to uh, do the awareness building. ADB is supporting with investments also at the uh, local level the uh, improvement of the MDGs. This is high on our agenda when we discuss the country partnership strategies with our countries. We always make reference then related to the priorities we agree upon with a given country to the accomplishment of the MDG. So it is high on our agenda, but also high on the agenda of our partner countries. 
Next uh, three questions, please. Ching, uh, Jack, and Dr. Biswas. Yes. Ching, please go ahead. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. Schaefer for an illuminating talk. I was surprised to learn about social st uh, the social component of the stimulus package spending, uh, especially for Singapore, which is known for its uh, uh, extremely frugal attitude towards social welfare. Uh, half of the stimulus spending was on, uh, was on social. Given the f high payoffs that you've shown us from s this component of uh, stimulus spending, why do the other countries um, spend so little uh, on, on, social, on the social component? I should preface by saying that I did spend a few years of my life at ADB. So, um, one, I think your vulnerability uh, data is, is interesting, but it shows sometimes the error that uh, ADB makes when it lumps Pacific countries along with the rest of the world. And if you look at that data, you see all of a sudden that Cook Islands is doing quite well, but Cook Islands is New Zealand. Cook Islands is not Cook Islands. You need to, and that's why it does well. I mean, you know, when you look at that, you say to yourself, why is Cook Islands all the way up there, and why, is, uh, why are some of the other Pacific Islands not there? And that's because, one, Cook Islands is New Zealand, and then the other Pacific Islands, I think this whole notion of vulnerability uh, can be looked at from many different angles. And, and so there is some issues that, don't, that are not represented in that graph that probably would move those islands somewhere else. But I think the other issue is the MDGs. I think the MDGs is one thing that the development banks, especially Mark Malik Brown, sold the whole world as a vir brilliant public marketeer. I mean, it was a brilliant concept. And everybody bought in. The question now is, when you don't reach them in 2015, and you don't need to be a rocket scientist for that, when you don't reach them in 2015, what will be the next agenda? What is it that you're going to tell the rest of the world? Why they weren't reached, and, 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 and how can we go around it? And I think part of the reason why they, will not, they haven't been reached, and that continues, and I did participate in, in uh, the f one of the meetings run by uh, the International Monetary Fund, uh, World Bank, ADB, and UNDP, on taking stock of MDBs in 2001, and it's because the countries are not part of it. It's, it at that time, even ADB was not part of it. It was managed totally by, by, the, by, by, the, by the fund and, and, and the World Bank. And so it becomes very difficult to get this buy-in at the political level, to the question that was being asked again. The MDGs cannot be driven f from one end only. It, I, I think there needs to be a, a partnership of some sort. And, and my, uh, the, the answer I don't have is what happens in 2015 when the data is not, you know, will be in and will not be all, all rosy. I mean, it'll, it'll be, it'll be multicolored, but there'll be, there'll, you know, if we go back to your first chart, there'll be a lot of blacks and, and reds and whatnot. Dr. Biswas, third question. It's not a question, rather a couple of comments. First, listening to the questions here, my young friends seem to think that MDGs were something that were done in 2000. Let me share with you that is the farthest from truth. The goals were all there. They were there in 1970s, 1980s. If you look at the water, we had more ambitious goal in 1980s, the International Water Supply Day and Sanitation Decade. If you look at the health, there the Almaty Declaration of WHO where all the goals were stipulated. All these goals we see as MDGs are repackaged old goals which could not be achieved. And the problem is not to look 
whether the glass is half full, half empty, but look at the progress that has been done since 1970s, 80s to now. If you look in that context, there has been remarkable development, especially when you consider the population growth in the, in the developing world. What MDGs did, unfortunately in my view, is only took the old goals, the UN's old goals, that were in the 19, valid in 1970s and 80s, and repackaged them in a slightly different way. Starting with the 1990 base, they said by 2015, we'll reduce all this to half the population of what was in 1990. But even if you reach MDGs, in 2015, we still have another half of the population still to be looked after. So it will be a continuous process. It's not going to be done overnight. And the real problem is with so many goals and some many important goals not included in MDGs, how do we keep the interest? I think somebody in the back asked, how do we keep the interest of the national governments? International institutions can do only so little. ADBs and the World Banks and the Inter-American Development Bank can only do a limited part, very limited part. It's the countries that have to do themselves. It's the people who have to do, who have to work at these MDGs. And I'm, I'm delighted that uh, uh, Dr. Ursula is, I think the only, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, the only very senior official in any development bank who has the designation of knowledge Vice President, there is no other knowledge Vice President looking at knowledge issues, knowledge generation, knowledge synthesis, knowledge dissemination, knowledge application. You have a tremendous challenge in front of you. Two things I would like to suggest you might wish to consider. One is what were the real constraints as a result of which the goals that were promulgated in the 1970s and the 1980s by the international community did not succeed. With all due respect, all the studies done by the UN are paperwork. Nobody did any serious work. So why, why did he fail? That would be one. Second, are all the important millennium, are all the important development goals included in MDGs? I find it difficult to see, for example, there's no mention of energy. Do we not, do the human beings do not need energy? There are very many other areas because there are no previous goals, we don't have a goal in MDGs. And we need some real thinking. And this is where I think Ursula's group can make an important contribution to the development dialogue saying what could be the MDGs and uh, are, they, are they all included? And what is more important? Are we playing, again, somebody asked, are we playing games with the statistics so that the countries can check the box, say we have reached the Millennium Development Goals? For, take the area of water, subject I know. All the figures we get from the international organizations, I have to say they're not very helpful. I do not know a single person in India who has clean drinking water. And in 1977, who was when we proposed international water supply sanitation decade, and the objective of which was in 10 years, everybody should have clean drinking water. That clean drinking water was, the definition was uh, massage, and you, if you look into the issue of what is clean drinking water, if you do that, you say all the cities in Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Jakarta, all of these have access to clean water. And you can't drink that water. That was not what we had in mind. And so I think what we need to do is to look what were the objectives, what we are doing, and what do these data mean. And that, I think, would be a real contribution to the development dialogue. Well, I'll just uh, try to respond uh, to some of Professor Biswas uh, comments and remarks. It's good that you um, um, go back um, to the 70s, where well, we had the first development decade, we had the second development decade, and then in uh, the 80s, well, after that we didn't count really, more. well, there was a third development decade, but everybody knew uh, this wouldn't reach us any further anymore, and then the uh, uh, MDG um, 
uh, assessments um, has been put together by, by the UN family, and we all know this is just um, a rough assessment on the, um, of the main problems we do have, but I think it's at least a way to um, see how we have to move on and where are the real gaps. And then indeed the question being, um, should we not adjust here and there this uh, full spectrum of these eight um, UN MDGs? But th that is the a discussion I started to, to raise this issue with, uh, with Norlin Heiser from UN SCAP and Ajay Chibber uh, from UNDP. And they said, um, please, at the moment, let us not yet look into that. It's too early. Let us first see whether we cannot move on a step further uh, towards uh, 2015 and not start diluting the picture with um, new additional elements. So at the moment, we, we are not really, or the other two partners are not um, um, really prepared to, to um, come up with proposals before the Secretary General then in September um, might um, come up with some additional ideas. So we, we have to be a little bit careful here. But let me in that context mention that at least in the case of the Asia and Pacific region, the three organizations together, a bank and two UN organizations, have come uh, to a joint assessment. You can imagine this was not always easy because we look into the uh, um, statistical database a little different from how UNSCAP and UNDP is doing it. And this joint um, exercise wherein uh, UN uh, ADB has put a lot of funds into certain statistical areas where so far nothing um, had been done. Um, we, this is really a good cooperation and the other regions, um, CEPAL for Latin America and um, 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 ECA for Africa uh, have started the same but with a, a lesser degree of um, success, so to speak. That means we are rather advanced in the joint work between the UN family and ADB and I find this really a very good thing. While you criticize um, uh, quite a bit uh, UN uh, statistics and so on, they rely on the national statistics and how can they be better when the national bases are not there, when they don't have the money to come up with a proper database. So there are a lot of complexities um, involved. I can understand your concern, but I think at least the three organizations try on a regional basis to do what they can uh, to improve the database and by that then also um, give a better um, basis for future decisions to the policy makers. I know nothing is perfect, but I think we really um, um, try to move in, in the right direction together. Um, one other, sorry? Question about energy well, I, I answered that in saying that we cannot really look into everything. And uh, there are data for energy um, available. There was a big international energy conference and there are uh, also targets, but they are not uh, indeed not included in the um, um, MDG menu at the moment. Um, partnerships, yeah, I think it's clear we have to um, work um, jointly on partnerships and, and we do that. I think we have made a lot of progress. Um, looking again into the uh, issue with a statistical database, in particular the Pacific Islands, we do have um, a very weak database. We are now together um, with other organizations concerned, um, try uh, to, to improve this, but this is really a very, very big challenge. It takes time. And then again here, um, uh, in that context, you also have to look into the ownership. When the uh, um, institutional and the capacity uh, level of the governments um, is very weak, it's, we cannot just do it then ourselves. It, we have to really get our partners on the ground involved and when for them statistical uh, capacity building is not the highest uh, 
um, priority uh, uh, issue on the agenda because we have other problems, we have to live with what is there. So it's always um, a compromise we, we have to work in. Um, the last, um, of this, that was your first question, looking into the uh, um, uh, social components and uh, why um, did um, some countries really not put more emphasis um, on, in the, on the social spending side? When you look here again in the slide, um, China gave a lot of funds into education and health in the times of crisis, when, when the crisis started, and that really had uh, quite some imp impact. The same happened in uh, Thailand, um, also um, and to a, um, a lesser degree in Vietnam, and we know that this really had quite some effect. Other countries did not have the funds available, or they do not have, and this is another problem, the um, appropriate receiving structures. So when you put um, uh, money into um, the social sector in a very general, uh, in very general terms, and um, you do not have effective uh, um, um, arrangements to get the money down to the poor people on the ground, it's difficult. In the Philippines, they have um, a social welfare um, um, a ministry with quite a broad network of uh, local agents which then uh, receive the funds and, and distribute it to the poor or they have uh, special arrangements. There it is more or less, let me say it like that, working, but when you do not have such a receiving structure, it is difficult to, even if you had the funds, to properly address it to those who need it. So there are still a lot of, of open questions, but in case the fund, there would have been the right structures and the governments would have been prepared to put more money into a social spending, it would have been really better and, and would have been really uh, to the uh, um, um, advantage of, of the poor people because they would have then spent the money. I think this is okay, I'm afraid I think we have uh, run up the limits of our time and um, considering that the Vice President just flew in from Delhi very early this morning, I think we've subjected her to a schedule that is uh, what anybody can endure beyond a very late lunch hour. So please uh, join me in thanking the Vice President for coming here to Singapore.